Amen. All right, today we're continuing a series we began last week called The Picture Perfect Life. How many of y'all were here last week? Amen. A number of you all. How many of y'all were not here last week? Okay, it's a decent amount of you all as well. So we, we of course, had a great friend Sunday. We ended up having, uh, the last number I saw was 31 people make a decision for Jesus last week. So you all did a great job of bringing people far from God, and we got to see lives changed. And we started last week by having everybody take a selfie. In fact, go ahead and pull, that, pull out your phone again. It doesn't hurt to take another selfie. Go ahead and take a selfie of yourself. If you don't have a phone, that's all right. Go ahead and pretend like you're taking a selfie. I'm going to actually take a selfie this week, make it look good. All right. Now take a look at your selfie. How'd you do? Ooh, my, that's pretty bad. How'd y'all do? Right? Some of you, I, I, I need to take another selfie, but we're not going to do that right now. But if you look at your selfie, you know, what does it look like, right? You know, when you look at it, you're, you're evaluating if something's out of place, if something's missing, if you need to add a filter or something along those lines. And really what we're doing in this series is we're taking a selfie of our lives. We're evaluating if something's out of place in our lives, if something's missing in our lives, if we've been adding filters to it to make our lives look better than they really are. And for some of us, our selfie doesn't look all that great. And we're frustrated about it. Some of us, we've kind of even given up on things changing. We've resigned ourselves to the idea that our lives will never really be picture perfect. But God wants you to have a picture perfect life. He simply wants to make your life better. And so what we're doing in this series is that we're showing you how to let him make your life truly be the picture perfect life. And so last week, we we looked at a couple of things. We found out, first of all, that there are really seven puzzle pieces of prosperity. In fact, we can put that on the screen for our audience to see. We learned that God wants you to prosper in all these seven areas, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, professionally, and financially, meaning that he wants you to have the joy of a relationship with him, health in your body, peace in your mind, happiness in your emotions, love in your relationships, success in your career, and to have plenty of money. We found that the missing puzzle piece for many of us is the middle piece in the picture we just showed you, and that is your relationship with God. That if you're not prospering spiritually, all the rest doesn't matter. And and, and so, If we're going to have the picture perfect life, we've got to start by making sure we're prospering spiritually, by making sure we have the relationship with God that God intends for us to have. And for some of us, that means that we need to find God. You have to make a decision to truly allow him into your life. For others of us, that means that you need to truly be on fire for God that you can't just have fire insurance. You know, well, I'm going to heaven. No, God wants you to have a relationship with him that is on fire for you to be in love with him and doing amazing things for him. And then we ended then by saying that what Jesus is ultimately saying to all of us is that we need to simply come closer to him. The Bible says when you come close to God, God will come close to you. And so for some of us, we come closer by becoming a part of his family. Other, others, of us, others of us need to return to the family. And some of us need to develop a daily relationship with God. And all of us need to come closer by eventually getting in the family business, by helping God save the world. Today, I want to go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, and let's just set up where we're going for the rest of this series. I got a little echo up here, you all, sound team, so help me out. Romans 8 verse 32 It says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. I want you to notice the word spare and delivered because those are pretty descriptive terms. I think they're excellent terms for what God did. God 
sent Jesus to be tortured and crucified. And when that time came, or even Jesus was saying, man, God, if there's any other way, let's do that. God didn't allow him to take him out. He didn't spare him from being beaten and whipped and having nails put on his hands and nails put on his feet and hanging on a cross. He didn't spare him from having to go to hell in our place. He had him go through all of that. He delivered him up so that he would go through all of that for us. So if he did that for us all, as the scripture says, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Somebody say all things. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? One translation says, won't he also give us everything else? I like what one minister said. He gave you Jesus. What's rent? Did you get that? I mean, if he gave you Jesus, the most valuable thing he could give you, of course he'd take care of your rent. Of course he'd take care of your body. Of course he'd take care of your family. Of course he'd take care of all these other areas of your life. He gave you Jesus. And so God is not interested in you just prospering spiritually. That's number one on his list by far. That's the most important thing. But he's also interested in you prospering in other, every other area of your life. You know, John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and, and have it more abundantly. If you look up the word saved, the Bible says, whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't just mean spiritually being born again. It also means having safety. It means having health. It means having success. It means having money. I mean, he gave you Jesus, so why wouldn't he give you everything else? He wants you to have the picture perfect life where you're prospering in every area, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, professionally, and financially. So I want to focus on two of those areas today. I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Y'all too quiet for me. Has God been good to y'all this week? I I know this is the cultured crowd. I know y'all a little bit more mature spiritually. That means y'all should be even wilder for Jesus than the new crowd. They still trying to figure some stuff out. You already know how good he is. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm, going to start preaching. I know there's some new people here as well, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, man. We on fire for God. Jesus came and died for you, man. He went to hell in your place. You will never have to spend a day in hell because of what Jesus did for you. That ought to be reason enough to give God praise and, and have a smile on your face. Heaven is your home. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. You know what I want to get across to you today is a very simple thing. God wants you to have a healthy body and a happy home. Somebody said that. Say healthy body, happy home. Turn to him and tell him, I said healthy body, happy home. Find somebody else, tell him, I said healthy body, happy home. FX online, put that in the comments. Healthy body, happy home. He gave you Jesus. Of course, He'll give you health. Of course, he'll make your home life wonderful. So 1 Peter 2, let me just teach you because I, I got this uh, convention anointing on me. I'm ready to preach about two, three hours here. That, that's not going to work. We got a whole other group coming in here. So, so y'all pray for me. Verse 24, this is talking about Jesus. Who his own self, who himself bore our sins in his own what? Body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Notice this last phrase. By whose stripes you were, what? Healed. Healed. This is talking about Jesus. Of course, we just finished mentioning the fact that he was beaten. He was whipped. He had nails driven through his hands and through his feet. He hung on a cross. All of that torture that he dealt with was 
in his body. His body is what suffered that. Now, we know there was more than that happening. But clearly, a lot of that happened in his body. He bore the punishment for our sins in his body that day. And there's a specific reference here to the stripes that he bore. History tells us that he had 39 stripes placed on his back. That what was used was something called a cat of nine tails that is made in such a way that when it hits your back, it rips the flesh out of your back. Many of us watched here at FX Church on Good Friday, the Passion of the Christ. We saw that acted out. It was gruesome. He went through that. That's a historical fact. The Bible is a very, it's probably the most historic, accurate historical book you will find. We've talked about that. So he actually had these stripes placed on his back. Why? Why did he go through what he went through in his body? Well, the first part is, of course, that you can be saved. as a, You can be brand new in God. But the second half of this is so that you could be healed in your physical body. In fact, some people will look at this scripture and, you know, people do all kinds of gymnastics to, you know, try to take healing and prosperity out of the Bible. So they'll say, well, no, that word healed means saved. It's referring to salvation. Well, there's nowhere in the Bible that healing, that salvation is called healing. Because when someone becomes a new believer, the Bible says on the inside, your spirit man becomes brand new. Your spirit man doesn't get healed. God doesn't patch you up. God rebirths it. You know, he replaces it. So this is not talking about healing in your spirit. It's talking about healing in your body. In fact, the word healed here means cured. Somebody say, I'm cured. Say it like you mean it. I'm cured. Think about that sickness the doctor is telling you about. You're dealing with this morning. Say, I'm cured. You need to let the devil know I'm cured. I, I, I don't have this. I've been cured. By his stripes ye were, and notice that, you were, see this, the by his stripes, that tells you when it happened as well as how it happened. By his stripes. Well, when did he take these stripes 2,000 years ago? So when was I healed 2,000 years ago? Not you're going to be healed, not you're trying to be healed. It is an actual settled final fact that you were healed, you were cured 2,000 years ago. Jesus actually paid for your healing then. He paid a heavy price so you could have a healthy body. Because God wants you to have a healthy body. In fact, look at James chapter 5. Verse 14. Notice this that was written to believers, a church. He says, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Wait a minute. Notice what he didn't say. If any of you are sick, just live with it. If any of you are sick, just know God's getting glory from it. See, this is religious stuff. That's not what the Bible says. He said, by the way, FX Church, if there's any wrong you sick, which implies that really none of you should be. But if it so happens that some of you are sick, then this is what you probably need to do. And he's referring to this particular context. There's more here that I could teach. I won't get too deep into it. There's at least seven ways that you can receive healing. And really, God wants you to be able to get healing on your own. But sometimes people just aren't there yet. And that's why God has given multiple ways to receive physical healing. He just wants to meet you wherever your faith is. And so in this case, he says, there any sick among you? And he says, here, let them call for the elders of the church. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, the Bible says. And one translation says it will heal the sick. So when, when, when I pray in faith as an elder over you, an elder today, we would call him a pastor or minister. Well, when I'm doing that, I am allowing God's power to work in your body, right? And so here he's saying, hey, this is how you become somebody who is healed is by just going ahead and calling for the elders of the church. They'll pray for you so you can be healed. Does it sound like God wants you healed? 
right? If you were to read the next scripture, it talks about, you know, uh, how we ought to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another that we may be what? Healed. There's another way of receiving healing. It's through the prayers of others. Well, it sounds to me again like God wants me healed. God wants me healthy. And I've already mentioned to you, there's multiple ways for you to be receive supernatural healing in your body. Why did God give all those ways? Gifts of healing is one example, right? In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said to the disciples, when you go preach about Jesus, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. If you look at Jesus' ministry, he went about preaching and healing everywhere he went. Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I mean, healing is a part of God's ministry. It's a part of Jesus' ministry. It's part of what God wants for you. And that is for you to have a healthy body. Somebody say a healthy body. <laughs> but let's go a step farther. Psalm 91 and verse 10. We could spend all day preaching on healing. We've done a couple of series on them. You can find them on our app. No more pain and the like. Because you need to get in the word of God on this to, to really get your arms around it. But there's another part of your body, another part of this that we haven't talked about as much. Psalm 91. I'm actually going to back up to verse 3 in the New King James Version. And most people have heard of this. It starts by saying, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And, and then it says in verse 3, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terrorist by night. Oh, it didn't say terrorist. It said terror, didn't it? But it's the same thing. Nor for the gunshots, I mean the arrow, that fly up by day. I mean, it's the same thing, isn't it? Nor for the COVID-19, I mean the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Nor for the, the, the destruction that wasted that noonday. Here's your missiles right there. A thousand shall fall by your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Verse 10. This is where I really want to get to. What's the point? No evil shall befall you. Somebody say no evil. No evil, no evil shall befall you. No evil. Not a little bit. None. What does the word evil there mean? It refers to calamity. It refers to harm. Distress. So no car accidents. Nobody cutting their fingers off on mistake at home. Nobody's kids getting knocked out. Come on now. No one being held up. Being carjacked. See, this is what this is referring to. Well, that's what people in the world deal with. Right. But you're not like them. You've entered into the family of God. Come on. You dwell in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. That's why I read these scriptures to you. Because under his feathers, you are, you're covered. Under his wings, you trust. That's why you don't have to be afraid of terrorists or gunshots or, or, or sickness or disease because you have God's divine protection over your body. No evil shall befall you. But notice the second half of the scripture, nor shall any plague. But well, there's your sickness and disease. Well, it's flu season, not in my house. Come on, you got to take this position because this is part of God's protection. That, well, you know, I'm worried about this, this COVID-21, whatever they come up with. Doesn't matter. Not in my house. Why? Because I'm under his protection. It won't just come, won't come against me, but it's not coming in my house. See, 
He said it won't come near your dwelling. It can come close to your house, realize it's your house, and skip over your house and go to the next house. Oh, Pastor, I don't know about that. Is that not what happened in the Old Testament in Egypt when God said, put the blood on your doorpost, put the blood on the sides of the door, and when the deaf angel comes through the town, when it sees the blood on your house, it will skip over your house and go to the next house. See, we need this in 2024 because there's things that are happening and things that probably will happen that don't have to happen to you. Come on. If you're in the secret place of the Most High, if you're one of His and you're living your life in a way that He says to live it. You got to put this in your mouth every day. It's one of my daily confessions. Every day over myself, my family. No evil shall befall us. No plague shall come near our dwelling. If you keep reading, it goes on talking about why. He give his angels charge over you. They lift you up unless you even dash your foot against the stuff. God doesn't want you stubbing your toe. He actually talks about you dominating in this realm. This is what's provided for you. This is the picture perfect life. With long life, the scripture ends here, this chapter, will I satisfy you. We don't die early. Well, Y'all not hearing me this morning. I said we don't die early. We live long, satisfying lives. We go when, when we're ready to go. Like Jacob did. Or, or was it Jacob? Yeah, when he had brought his whole family around him. And he, he sat there and he prophesied to all of his kids. Told them what the Lord was going to do. And then was like, all right, let her rip, Lord. And then he left. You don't even have to die from sickness. You don't have to go out like that. It can just be, it's time. The Lord's calling me home. I'm ready to go home. I can see I'm up here. I'm trying to get y'all to come with me here because this is a part of the life that God has provided for you. Come on, John 17, verse 15. I don't know, y'all did some good praying this morning. I feel, I feel my help coming on, the old preachers would say. I feel something up in this place. Come on, man. God wants you to have a healthy body, free from sickness and disease, free from any type of attacks. We walk in divine protection. John 17, Jesus just finished saying in verse 14 how the world would hate us because we follow him. We've seen that. But then he doesn't say, so God take him out of the world. In fact, he says it this way in verse 15. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. So he's saying, yeah, the world's going to hate us, they're going to attack us, but we still got to stay here because we have a mission. We got to help people far from God experience the future God has for them. Help as many people miss hell and go to heaven as possible. So while we're here, he's saying, God, give them diplomatic immunity. See, the Bible says that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador for Christ. What happens with an ambassador? You know, an ambassador to our country, or ambassador from our country to another country, they have diplomatic immunity over there. They still have the protection of the United States of America, even if they're an ambassador in Israel or somewhere in Africa. And since you are now from heaven, you are heaven's representative. You are an ambassador for Christ, and God has given you diplomatic immunity. He will keep you safe from Satan's attacks. He will keep you safe from Satan's sickness. He will keep you from the evil. So you've got to understand that this is what belongs to you. This is a part of the picture perfect life God wants you to have. Now go to John, James chapter 5. Now a big part of that is learning to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because you have to follow instructions. That's being, you know, the Bible teaches he that dwells in a secret place. That's how that psalm starts. That's the place of obedience. And so when God prompts you to not get on the plane, don't get on the plane. And my father, he tells a story about, and I remember this, 1997, he was in California and he was planning to come home and God prompted him to not come home yet, had him shift and go to San Francisco. So he changed his plans, went to San Francisco and the plane that he would have came home on crashed, everybody died. The media had already written stories. They had it prepared 
to write about how Keith Butler, pastor of Word of Faith, perished in his plane crash. Except he didn't because the Holy Ghost told him, don't get on the plane. And there's many other stories like that where God has prompted people and you need to follow that prompting because it could save your life. I'll tell you one other one. We had Pastor Blue in here last month for our dream team. So I remember him telling me this story. He used to pastor the church we had in London, England, and they had a member there, a woman who got up to go to work one day, and she got up like normal, and she just had something in her heart like, no, no, don't go just yet. And so for a minute, she paused, and then she was like, no, I need to go. I'm going to be late to work. So she started getting ready again, and she got that again. No, don't go just yet. So finally, she said, all right, I don't know what this is, but I'm just going to wait. The train that she would have gotten on ended up being bombed by terrorists. She would have lost her life. But because she followed that prompting of the Holy Spirit, she was able to tell that story about God saving her life. Right? And there's, like I said, there's so many other stories. 9-11, there's so many stories of Christians where God said, run, and they didn't know why. And they just start running, and it saved their lives. So God will provide you. He'll give you divine protection, but you do have to follow his prompting. Okay, here's the key to this. God wants you to have a healthy body, right? So here's the key. James chapter 5, boy, verse 15. I'm looking at that clock like, I don't know how I'm going to do all of this. We just finished reading this, right? If there's anybody sick among you, call for the elders of the church, right? Notice verse 15. It says, such a prayer offered in what? Faith, Faith will heal the sick. Wait, wait, wait. So he didn't say... The elders will heal the sick. Remember he said, call for the elders. He said, the elders will heal the sick. He didn't say, the oil will heal the sick. Remember he said, anoint them with oil. Some, I saw a video this week of some preacher anointed some kid with oil, and it was like, Can you, are you going to stop at any point? But the oil doesn't heal the sick. He didn't say prayer will heal the sick. No, the prayer offered in what? Faith. faith. Only the prayer of faith. Faith, only faith will heal the sick. Faith is the vital ingredient in receiving healing. It's also the vital ingredient in walking in divine protection. See, those things belong to you in the spirit realm. They're in your spiritual bank account, but you must make a withdrawal. The reason why so many Christians are sick and the reason why you see Christians have evil befall them is because they've had this sitting in their bank account, but they didn't know how to withdraw it. You know, you've got money in your bank account right now. You can pull up to the bank. You can get to the ATM, and then you go ahead and put your card in. You put your code in, and you withdraw what belongs to you. And so many of us don't know how to do that. because to, and, and how do I do it? You just use your faith. You have to do it in faith. What, what is faith? Well, it, it's, the word faith comes, comes from a Greek word, pistis. It refers to persuasion. Uh, but just to help you with that, uh, I'll say very simply, it's 100% confidence in God. 100% confidence in God. So the Bible uses phrases like fully persuaded, nothing wavering. In other words, when I ask God, I am 100% confident that God's going to give me what I ask for. In fact, let me say it a different way. In fact, let's, I'm going to read to you Mark 11:24. 24. I, don't, I didn't give this to the team. Maybe you guys can throw it up there quickly because I can see already that I'm not getting to the other half of this message. Somebody say, God wants me to have a healthy body. Oh, say it like it means. God wants me to have a healthy body. Healthy, yep. By his stripes, you are what? You're healed. You are cured. You're not going to be healed. You are healed. And no evil shall befall who? Somebody say, not in my house. Not just won't befall you, it won't befall your kids. Come on, your dog going to be healthy. Your dog going to be old. Be boy, be walking like 25 years. How that dog that old? No evil befalls us and no plague comes near my dwelling. Come on, y'all. Why, why are you talking about this so much? Because me talking about it is building your what? Faith. faith. Because what makes, it, what makes it happen is faith. That's what makes it happen. If you operate in faith, 
picture perfect life. If you operate in doubt, one minute I believe it, the next minute I don't, or I just don't believe it at all, then you are rich spiritually. Health belongs to you. Protection belongs to you. But you're living like a pauper because you don't know how to withdraw what belongs to you. I've heard stories about people who, you know, had paintings on the wall and they lived in abject poverty. And then when they died, you find out the painting was worth millions of dollars. It's a lot of Christians. And if you're somebody that's following Jesus, he gave you Jesus and he gave you everything else with him. But you need to learn how to withdraw what he gave you. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says this, what things soever you desire. When you pray, when do I do this? When you pray, believe that. That's important. Don't miss that. Those of us been around for a while, we, we know this scripture, we'll quote this scripture, but no, 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 no. Believe that. See, a lot of us, when we pray, we might believe that God hears me. We might believe that God says yes. We might believe that God's going to make it happen. That's not what he said. He said, believe that you what? Receive, Receive it when? When you, pray. when you pray. So I'm not believing that one day is going to happen. I believe that the minute I say amen, I got it. I received it then. So if I ask for healing and say, God, heal me of this particular sickness or this pain, I ask, now in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. And here's the key. From now on, I stay healed. That's how I think about it. That's how I talk about it. I praise God for it. This is where we miss it because we start off in faith and we say, I'm healed. But then after, all of a sudden, after a few minutes, we, we didn't put our faith back down. Well, one day, or we call, <laughs> I must not be healed after all. No, no, no. This is why the Bible calls this, and many of us know the scripture, it says, fight the good fight. Well, oh, I got to say this like my father did. If y'all been around, you know, he, this was his thing. Remember the fight, the good fight of faith. Oh, God, I did it. I did it. Don't ever send that to him. Anyway. Right. This is the fight of faith. What's the good fight of faith? It's the fight to get in faith and to stay in faith. So once you pray and you believe you receive, now the fight's on. Say it's trying to get it out your hands and you're trying to hold on to it. And he makes you feel even worse. And no, 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 no. I'm healed. Well, no, one day, no, no, not one day, I'm healed. I'm already healed. In fact, Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. I just withdrew it when I prayed for it. I'm healed. I'm not letting this go. I am healed. And the same thing with divine protection. Oh, they, they said we might be attacked here, and there's, there's 17,000 terrorists in the country, and, and on, on, and on, 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 on. That all may be true, but guess what? My house is protected my children are protected so father i ask that you protect my children protect my house protect my church i believe i receive it in jesus name no evil shall befall fx church and it, i'm just saying it by faith right now in the name of jesus so what does that mean that it doesn't matter what they say is going on it doesn't matter what sickness is going around i'm protected you're protected. My kids are protected. I got immunity, baby. I'm not worried about... Oh, see, y'all, I'm just telling y'all, I'm just... You got to get there. See, faith is crazy to the natural mind. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. And, and, and so it, it's going to be different than what you see. It's going to be different than what you normally think. It's going to be different than how the world thinks. But, but we got something they don't have. You know, and we know something they don't know. And because of that, we can walk by faith and have supernatural results. We can have the picture perfect life. Well, Pastor, I mean, that sounds great, but I am not there. How do I get there? One more scripture, Romans 10, 17.
Faith is the secret ingredient. You go to your favorite restaurant, you have your favorite meal, you get it from them because there's some way they make it. There's some ingredient they put in it that makes it special, right? And faith is the secret ingredient to your picture-perfect life. You've got to believe. But when you believe, man, let me say it another way, how you approach this. When you're at the restaurant and you place an order, do you believe you receive it right then? You do. It's not, this is not a, a super crazy concept, hard to understand. The minute I order for my, my steak and fries from Jay Alexander's, I don't even think about it. I just keep having a conversation with whoever I'm, you know, with my wife, or I think I was just there with one of my friends, and we just talking, and I didn't, I didn't even get, the minute I told the usher, the usher, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm at church, the waitress, what I wanted, and gave specific instructions, right? Well, I, I wanted medium or medium well, and I wanted to, the minute I did that, I didn't think about it anymore. That's how faith works. Some of you all who are addicted to Amazon.com, you understand this. Yeah. Walk up to your house, you got to get through all the boxes to even come say hi to you. Come on, you, you, you pull some up on your phone or on your tablet, you hit order, you believe you've received it. You like, I know it's, you're not even thinking about it. You're planning for what are you going to do, where you're going to put it in the house, or where you, when you're going to wear it. Or, you're not thinking about it. That's faith. If we can have faith in Amazon, if we can have faith in J. Alexander's, we can definitely have faith in the God of the universe who sent us something to die for you and to rise again and chase you your whole life because he wanted you so badly in his family. Romans 10, 17 says this. How do I get to this faith? For faith cometh how? By hearing, and hearing by the what? The word of God. Hear me on this. I think at times the church, in terms of the whole church, all the Christians in the world, have underestimated the intensity by which you need to do this. Faith comes by the word of God. You have to place God's word in your heart. This is really where this battle is happening. And you have to keep it here. And most people do not take the time to actually put the scriptures in their heart. And then we say, well, I tried it. You didn't try it. You never did it in the first place. Because this doesn't work. Your gun doesn't fire if there are not bullets in the chamber. Most people, if you say, tell me what scripture you're standing on, they can't even tell you that. Well, if I don't even have any scripture in me, then my faith gun's not going to work. I'm firing blanks. I'm running at Goliath with my mouth open, you know, trying to speak to Goliath. And Goliath is stumping me. Because this doesn't work if you don't take the time to put the word of God in your heart on that topic. Kenneth Hagin used to say, this is a spiritual, uh, a spiritual father for me among others. He said, find scriptures that promise you what you need from God. Because then you have a firm foundation for faith. So we went through some healing scriptures. There's so many more. You should see my notes. Take at least one, but you can really look at a number of them. You could get a book on healing. Listen to a series. Take the time to get that in here to, so to the place where the light has come on. You see it now. It's real to you. It's abiding in you. Now you pray. Because now you have faith. Sometimes we pray too fast. My prayer doesn't work if I don't have faith for that. So I need to pray and to get the word again, word of God in me in that area. So, you know, there's a lot of scriptures that tell us how to do this. In Joshua 1, 8, the Bible says meditate in the word of God day and night. See, here's the problem. We want to do it once every blue moon. And then we want faith to work. No, you need to be in your Bible every day. Read a chapter a day. And if you've got an area that you struggle in, then go ahead and look at those scriptures. For example, I've shared with you that health is one of the areas that I have battles in. So I'm reading a book called Christ the Healer almost every single day. 
I read chapter 8 and chapter 9. I alternate almost every single day. Why? For me, it's not just getting it in here. It's keeping it in here. And I find almost every day I'll read it and the light will come on about something. I'll be reminded about, oh, yep, that's right. That's right. I'm already healed. Nope. Not, 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 I'm healed. Change my thinking. I'm a healed person. Because this is where the fight is. Making sure the words in your heart, talking it, seeing it, thinking it, living it. Proverbs 4 says, give God's word attention. It says, incline your ear to his sayings. Don't let it depart from your eyes. Keep it in front of your eyes like this, man. Keep it in the midst of your heart because that's when God's word will be medicine to your flesh. Jesus said in John 15, 7, one of my favorite scriptures, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask for whatever you want. That would include health and protection and it will be given unto you. Take the time to get God's word in your heart so that the supernatural can be in your life. When it's real to you, it will be real for you and you'll be enjoying a picture perfect life. Come on, I'm out of time. Lift your hands toward heaven. Let's just thank God for the word of God. Tune to our weekly podcast where you'll be able to listen to the message from our Sunday experience. Our podcast is available on platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and more. Be sure to check us out, subscribe, and share.